things. Like,
Folks, we might get started shortly. Good morning, everyone. I know this is a very friendly conference, and but we, we would like to get started to give Stephen enough time to, uh, to speak this morning. Uktaran, Nagasa Karaja, Fulcherot Galer. It's my privilege to welcome you to the 2024 SESI conference and to stand in this position as co chair now of SESI after 12 years of attending these warm, convivial, enthusiastic events with colleagues and friends that have both sustained me personally and professionally. I encourage you throughout the day, if you do anything at all, is to talk to people, to spend the time that we have our catering, all our coffee and tea outside in the foyer, our lunches out in the foyer. We've done that to enable as much social time as we, as we possibly can um, in terms of our housekeeping. Our hashtag is SESICON. Try to use a microphone for any questions after Stephen's keynote. Um, our breakout sessions will be upstairs in the classrooms with the, uh, with the exception of the makerspace, which is out around to the, the corner. And I would just say to you, keep an eye on our social media and our mailing list because we do have some upcoming events for you, including next week in our AGM. And I would say at this stage, I would welcome Dr. Orla Flynn, president of Atlantic Technological University to officially open our 2024 conference. Um, delighted to welcome you all here this morning and uh, fair play to you all for making it. I know the weather has been fairly shocking in the last day or so. Uh, I was on my way to Sligo yesterday morning and uh, you know, I assumed that there was frost on the trees passing by and uh, as, I, as I kept going northwards, uh, I realised it wasn't frost, it was snow and it turned into fairly heavy snow. So um, delighted that you all made it uh, here today. Um, I think last year I spoke uh, a few words of welcome and, and I think last year kind of brought me back in time and my, my own academic qualifications were in, were in computer science and uh, as a, an, an educator in computer science, um, I can't help, help reflecting on the agenda that you have today and how utterly different the world is today from when, um, from when I was starting out as a, a lecturer uh, back, in, back, in the, back in the, let me think, um, <laughs> quite a long time ago. Um, just to say that uh, just, it's, it's wonderful to see the gathering, it's wonderful to see people coming together around the country. Um, Earlier in the week, I was at a conference, uh, a HEA conference on progression and student progression. And I do remember um, typically uh, computing and computer science at third level was always one of the ones that people um, struggled with. And it was always one of the areas where we, we, the progression rates tended to be that little bit lower. And I often reflected on why was that. And perhaps it was because when kids were going to school, you know, they always, they knew what teachers did, they knew what doctors did. Um, maybe, maybe they had parents who were engineers or, or lawyers or they, they kind of had a, a, a grasp on, on what a lot of careers were about. Um, but computing and computer science always seemed to be one of those, those careers, working, working in tech as, as we know it now, um, always seemed to be one of those exotic things. But the, the reality when you went to first year in college was, you know, it seemed to be very mundane and, and kind of boring sorts of stuff. You weren't doing any of the exciting stuff with computers. Um, the internet obviously was a, was a massive shift in, in our, and I'm, I'm going back to pre-internet days, but you know, the internet coming kind of opened a glimpse of a, of, of a, a really interesting, uh, interesting world. And you know, things have, have moved on in, in, um, in, in extraordinary, leaps and bounds maybe since then, for better and for worse. Um, delighted to, to see Mary Loftus in the audience. I met Mary on the way in. Mary is chair of our Athena Swan self-assessment team. And I think the issue of, uh, and, and looking around the room, it's great to see such diversity in the room, um, especially well from a gender diversity perspective, uh, because again, computing and tech, it's really, really important that, that diversity is represented in tech. And um, many of you might be involved in uh, education in secondary schools. And you know, the, 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 the task that we have is to, is to try and ensure that we have more girls in particular getting involved in tech. 
Um, no, no more, I suppose there's no better time really to emphasize that than now when we see the impact of artificial intelligence and, you know, again to see some of the themes coming in, in the conversations uh, today. Um, I don't think ChatGPT was mentioned in certainly, you know, three or four years ago, certainly wasn't mentioned three or four years ago, but the idea that it would be all pervasive and all ex eas so easily accessible. Um, my own my own master's a um, long time ago was uh, expert systems and their application in the area of social welfare. And, and expert systems were a kind of a, a pseudo AI uh, that, you know, they were kind of systems that would act as an expert to help you get, you know, travel whatever journey you were traveling on. Um, so AI would, would have would have done a bit of AI, I suppose, as, as, as background um, around that time, but uh, the, the real time and the, the sheer speed of ac accessing, the sheer volume of data that, that, was, that is now available just, just was unimaginable back then. You know, I think la this time last year I was reminiscing about my first, com my f I, I was in a class in UCC uh, where the first PCs were purchased and I think I was in third year when the lab of PCs came in and you know the, the the shifts in technology since then and I think you know again reflecting on um, having everything in the cloud and processing everything in the cloud and even in our own workplace since the pandemic um, how we communicate how we share files how we collaborate uh, tech can be a great enabler and I think certainly people have commented on ATU and how well we've gelled together how you know how how can we be working together as one organization? Um, we, 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 um, we're a new university, we, we're not even two years old, old yet, and we've nine campuses across the northern and western region of Ireland, stretching from Letterkenny in Donegal down to Galway, nine campuses, St. Angela's being the, the most recent um, campus and, and, and community to join us. And um, I often reflect that in, in the time of the pandemic, we, our, our productivity accelerated, our ability to meet, our ability to collaborate kind of accelerated during COVID. You know, previously it was a, a day long journey to, to go from A to B and to, to gather people together. Now we have meetings on a regular basis across the entire university. And the things that we are now trying to figure out is how can we build in that face to face time and do so in a really sustainable way. Um, we serve the Northern and Western region of Ireland. Our, our inaugural strategic plan was uh, approved just recently by our governing body. We'll be launching it uh, fairly soon. Um, but our, and our, our mission is going to be, our vision is certainly about enriching the quality of life um, for, for everybody in, in the region. And that's not just about, um, mon it's not just about money, it's about quality of life. And uh, I think there are so many aspects to that. Sustainability is a part of, of, of our strategy and maybe cutting down, using tech and using uh, compu computers as a way of uh, enhancing sustainability will be a, a big part of what we're about. So the work that you do has an impact in everybody's lives. And I'm not sure, and, and I think it needs to be said, you know how um, how how important the work that you do is, and how ins ensuring that people have a really good understanding of the role of technology, the role of computers in society, and certainly in education. Uh, just to, just to thank you for for the work that you do. Um, delighted to catch up for the second time this week, also with Tom Farrelly. Tom is on the agenda later today. Uh, Tom is uh, a colleague from MTU, and uh, Tom is very involved in the Intutor. Uh, Project and again, Intutor is around um, it's around digitalization, it's around uh, sustainability, but it's about enhancing all of our skills as educators, ensuring that our, our learners are partners with us in that journey. And Tom undertook a, an amazing journey during the week, uh, a travel around Ireland using sustainable modes of transport. So I'm delighted to see you again here. You must be wrecked, I'd say, or taken a week off after after that. And, and that's another, you know, that's a whole other dimension. So on that note, I'm going to show up and uh, delighted just again to see to welcome the keynote uh, speaker here this morning Stephen Kinsella and Stephen again is one of those I suppose early um, I'm going to say missionaries on on Twitter certainly you're you're you've been going out there uh, a long time kind of keeping us all informed and you know again social media when you think of kind of the changes and the ability to connect uh, people all around the world uh, through social media 
we are seeing a dark side of social media in very much in recent years and uh, I think uh, certainly that you, you, you have to mind the good people that are on there. Stephen certainly is one of the good people. So anyway, on that note, I'm going to shut up and let you all get on with the day. Um, enjoy. Come on, guys. Thank you very much, Dr. Flynn, for that. And just before I do forget, and thank you to the, the wider staff at Atlantic Technological University for facilitating us for the second year in a row, from everyone from the technical staff to the caterers, cleaners, and everyone in between. Um, it's, it's certainly made our voluntary work that bit easier. At this point, I'd like to introduce Stephen Kinsla from University of Limerick. Stephen is a professor of economics at the University of Limerick, head of the Department of Economics, and research associate at the Rhodes Centre for International Finance at Brown University, and he's co-director of the Immersive Software Engineering Programme, which I'm sure you'll hear all about today. Professor Kinsla leads the City Exchange, InCase, and Smart Lab research projects for UL, and is very interested in smart cities, new regional collaborations, economic networks, and in bringing thinking around natural capital into mainstream economic thinking. He is chief economics writer for the Currency News, and was for four years a columnist with the Sunday Business Post. He has written for The Guardian, The New York Times, and The Irish Independent, winning the Economic Commentator Award of the Year Award twice. He is now going to deliver his keynote talk, I won't take up any more of his time, The Future of Software. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Can, can everyone hear me? Yeah. I had to wander around, so uh, if you need me to be here, would you like me to be here? Is this better for me to be here? Okay, but in terms of the recording and all that, is that all good? Yeah. Because it's just better if I bounce around. If I stay there, I just tend to start vibrating in place. It's not good. Um, so I wanted to do a few things. Uh, first, thank you very much for the invitation to speak. It's a, a pleasure. It's an honor to be back here. Uh, the last time I was in ATU, it wasn't ATU. Um, I'm a huge fan of uh, the TU process. When I was the chair of the Higher Education Authority, um, it was one of the things I really, really wanted to achieve in that time, and it was a really... It's a really good thing um, uh, uh, that, that, uh, that it's being developed so quickly. And I've been uh, 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 corresponding with Dr. Flynn and watching her uh, and her team's progress for many years. And so it's been great to see. It's st I still think it's amazing that there's still no socially acceptable protocol for I know you from the internet. <laughs> like there really should be. Like we should have a little handshake or something, you know, but we don't. Um, it's nice to see so, so, so many familiar faces. It's also really nice to see that even in a room filled with lecturers and teachers and learning technologists and experts in computer science education, you all still sit at the back. <laughs> I think that's amazing. I think that's, there's, it just shows there's something deeply ingrained. Could you actually, you're, yeah. you're, all I can see on you is the projector reflecting on your face. So better to be here. Anywhere other than Okay, anywhere other than there. Okay, thanks. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, um, so I want to do a few things. So the, uh, the first thing uh, to do is I have all these slides I was going to bang through, and I, I'm just not going to do it. I just think we're, 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 we're slided out. I think this is my sixth public presentation this week. So I, 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 what I want, I'd like to do three things at the same time and in under 20 minutes because I want to get you guys back uh, on schedule. I, I think it's going to be an amazing day. So the first thing I want to do is I really want to talk to you about Ireland and where we are, okay? Where we are in the context of our economic development and where we are in the context of the technological revolution that is taking place. And I'll say this both as an economist and as a member of the government's AI Advisory Council, which is just convened um, this year. And uh, I can talk to you about AI and all that in the questions. So my, I, think I, I, I think I'm supposed to talk till 10 past 10. So my plan is to talk for like 20 minutes and then shut up and listen to you. And that's why I do these things. I do these things because I learn more if I shut up 
but the, the cost of me learning more is that I have to speak first. So, um, where are we? When, when b before ATU was a thing, before GMIT was a thing, uh, before cloud computing, before mobile computing, there was the telecoms revolution. So the telecoms revolution was essentially putting wires in the ground and sticking satellites into space, okay? So it's the, it's the revolution of the 70s and the 80s of the mainframe computer, okay? When you think about that moment in history and you think about Ireland, was there any way in which we would po were poised to take advantage of or lead in that space? No, not at all. We were not within an ass's roar of the frontier of that technological revolution. We bought in all the gear, we installed it, we put the wires in the ground, we, 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 we let the satellites fly overhead, and we, we did our best to, to come up to some speed. Think about mobile telephony. Is there an Irish mobile phone company? Is there an Irish handset? Is there, a, is there an Irish social media company? No, there's not. We were not at that level. What about cloud computing, the next major technological revolution? Well, we are actually doing pretty well in cloud, but only in one aspect of that, right? In one very specific aspect, which is the technological storage of cloud, right? And that has major positives for us and major negatives. Um, some of the major positives I will get onto, and some of the major negatives you're probably all aware of, the environmental issues and so on and so forth, the energy issues. Now we've got another technological revolution, which is AI, right? Are we poised to take some advantage of that? And the answer is absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. To take my own university, Ireland's first master's in AI 10 years ago, Ireland's CRT in AI, so a doctoral training program where we produce 50 PhDs in AI every year with industry, three new BSc, MSc, integrated AI programs, a machine learning for finance, and AI for finance. Um, it's an incredible story. Really, really, really incredible. That's one university. UL is great, love UL, it's fantastic, but it's just one university. We have more than 10. Think about all the cool stuff that's happening in ATU, all the cool stuff that's happening in UCD and Trinity and everywhere else. When we have, when we think about it carefully, <clears throat> we're, at a stage where we cannot just produce new employees that will go into these firms, we can produce people who will build the firms themselves, right? Ireland's economic progress has always, was, at least since the 1950s, been about bringing capital from the rest of the world here and then selling to the rest of the world. There's a lot of dinging going, it's like whoa, 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 can you hear that or is that just me? Okay, is there any way we can stop that? Because it sounds to me like I'm talking to you through a fish tank. <laughs> that wah, wah, wah thing. Okay. So we're going to figure it out. We're going to figure it out. If I go over here, is the womp womp still here? How about now? Is that better? Yeah. Oh my God, that's so much better. Thank God. Because I was like, as I was talking, I was like, womp, womp, womp. We can't be doing that for 20 minutes, though. That's, that's ridiculous. Okay. So, so where are we right now? We are at the stage where we can... We're at the stage where we can actually get to the actual edge of a technological revolution and move beyond it. And I want everybody to be aware that this is the first time in our history as a nation that that has been true. People often talk about Ardna Krusha as the last time that happened. So the big hydroelectric power plant produced 80, 86 megawatts. Right, which at the time was enough to power the whole country, and now it would not power Sligo. It's less than 2% of the power. But everybody neglects to mention that we bought that from Germany. Right? Uh, Siemens, in fact, who came back and wanted us, to, wanted us to do more. If you're ever interested in this, have a look at the, Sh have a look at the, Shannon, uh, the Shannon Power Act of 1925. 
You can get it if you just Google it now. It's absolutely fascinating. It quite literally gives the Minister for Enterprise, what trade and employment as of now was the Minister for Industry and Commerce at the time, the power to wipe out entire villages. Can you just imagine today? Yeah. Simon Cove like, hello, Arda Crusher. You're gone. You're right? Anyway, but, but an, extraordinary, an extraordinary feat. Um, so we're at this moment. So I'll, I'll give you two examples. There are two companies. One is called Protex AI. The other is called um, 10.dev. Uh, both, are, uh, well, both have gone into Y Combinator, the best technology accelerator in the world. Both are extremely well funded with millions of euros of venture capital. Both are recognized as being at the forefront of their AI development. Extraordinary companies. And they're both uh, basically a bunch of young people from Limerick. Right, um, who 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 have the idea? They have the confidence. They have the the business skills, and they're and off they pop. And I'm sure if we if I asked Dr. Flynn or any of the colleagues here, you would come up with three or four examples yourself of people who do that. Right, who have the startup thing, who understand how to do it, and who are mentoring this forward. In 2008, when the Irish economy collapsed, we had zero zero Irish companies valued at more than a billion euros. Zero. We now have 18, okay? Some of those are like Ryanair and stuff like that, but 13 of those 18 are technology companies like Intercom. So if you look at what Intercom is, Intercom is, you know when you go on a website and there's a little dot, like a dot at the, at the bottom, of, bottom right hand of the corner of the website and you click on that and it's the customer support? That's them. They're an Irish company uh, founded by a bunch, bunch of great bunch of people and uh, they do customer support, basically. They automate your customer support. Really simple business from one, at one level, very complicated from another. They just, uh, they, when ChatGPT debuted it la late last year, <coughs> they um, pivoted their company and they now produce an AI chatbot called Finn. And what Finn does is it takes your entire database and when you go, oh my, my mobile phone's not working, it just wipes it out. They wipe out all the customer support issues. They have now figured out that people want the customer support to be automated. They want it to be AI first, which means that the customer support function is going away, right? People who know that they're talking to an AI and get that, get that done faster have said they want this done using an AI. They don't want to talk to people. They just want it because because like you don't want to talk to a person. You, you just want your phone fixed. You want the service fixed, right? You don't necessarily care who's, who or what is fixing it. And it's been very, very interesting watching AI develop. But uh, uh, when you think about this from a national economic perspective, what we, what we are currently is a warehouse for the intellectual property of the rest of the world, okay? That is what we are. We are a warehouse. P uh, Apple's licensing, uh, 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 Microsoft's licensing and so forth. We, we bring their, their intellectual property here that's developed elsewhere, the ideas, the licensing patents and so forth, and we bring it here and then we, then we take a tiny slice of that enormous amount. And that is what powers our corporation taxes. So you may be aware 27% of all government revenue comes from corporation taxes. Each person in this room wakes up on the 1st of January with 4,200 euros in their pockets that they did not earn. They, these are taxes that you do not have to pay because the corporate sector is paying it for you. These run our public services, they pay our taxes, they pay our salaries because we're all public servants here, or most of us are. Um, and these come from the rest of the world. This is very, very welcome. But I'd like you to remember, some of you of a particular age will remember a time when we relied on one form of taxation that we weren't quite sure was going to stay there all the time. Does anybody remember that, what that was called? Stamp duty. I can say people, Ugh. <laughs> so there's people of a certain age who are like, Jesus Christ, I know that. I've forgotten that existed. And then there's other people who are like, what? What's that? You know? um, it is interesting to me the speed at which things become history. 
as, as I've gotten older, I've realized history happens much faster than you think. I, think. I used to think history was like 50 years or 100 years. I think history is about 12 or 15 years now. I'm, t I'm, I'm teaching a class with about 800 people in it, and there are young people. They were born in 2006, 2007. <laughs> you know what it's like. And I go, yeah, you know, the global financial crisis of 2007. And I li I, it's so interesting because it is a massive emotional resonance for me because I lived through it. And, I, and I, I really did, like, as an economic, I, as an economist, as, as an advisor to the government, and, and just as, as somebody who's, who's lived through it, it really f hits me, you know? And for them, it has exactly the same emotional resonance as the potato famine. <laughs> it's just a thing. Happened in the past. Death of Caesar, potato famine, global financial crisis. So, OK. So we are in this world where we are a warehouse for other people's intellectual property. Where we need to go to is to become a factory for our own intellectual property, OK? Warehouse to factory. How do we get there, right? If we are a factory, that means we're generating our own intellectual property. It means we're having our own ideas. We're turning them into companies. We're making our ideas real. We're selling those ideas to the rest of the world. And when we sell those ideas to the rest of the world, we get money. We create jobs. Those people pay taxes. And, this, and the show goes on. This is the foundation for national progress for the next century. Okay? And if you think about it in century terms, many of you may have, if you ask yourself, how long will I live? And you're like, if this boring bastard doesn't get off the stage, <laughs> not longer, not much longer. But if you think, how long will I live? Most of you might think 70, 80, right? The kids born now will live for 100 years. That means they will see the 22nd century. And if you think about that, that is Star Trek. Star Trek is set in the 22nd century. Like, that's incredible. So we have to be thinking in terms of centuries here. So the foundation for national progress for the next century is people who can make, have ideas and make them real and sell them to the rest of the world. Now, we need a couple of things for that to be true. The first is we have to understand that they have to be technically excellent in order to do that because they are competing against everyone else in the world. There will be 10 billion humans that these people will be competing against. Okay? Anyone in the world doing anything with a laptop or a whatever is competing against everyone else to do the same thing. That's the first problem. Second problem is the rate of technological progress is going to displace many of the existing jobs. It will create many more. It's already creating more. This is true, by the way, of every technological revolution. It's a, there are two books I'm going to recommend for you. Uh, the first is, is uh, by probably the best economist writing in the world at the moment, Professor Carlotta Perez. She is absolutely superb. She's got a book on technological revolutions, what technologies actually do to people. Carlotta Perez. She's got loads of YouTube videos and stuff as well. So, so like if you want to show her stuff to your students, she's an amazing, amazing economist. Another book is called How Asia Works by Joe Studwell. And it's a history of the economic development of Thailand and the Philippines and South Korea and, uh, and, and many of these other countries. It's amazing. It's written uh, from a journalist perspective and he goes into why these countries were so successful, how they developed. And how did they develop? Three ways. The first is leadership. They figured out that they wanted to do one thing, and they went off and did it. The second thing is export discipline. They figured out that they needed to sell stuff to the rest of the world, and that meant there was no infant industries. There was no like, oh, we're going to have an Irish car company, and we're only going to sell it to Irish people, and sure, it'll be grand. No, you've got to sell the car to the rest of the world and bring, bring treasure back. The third thing they did was they didn't listen to the economists. Because the, the, the leaders of South Korea were told, you'll never build a heavy metals plant. You don't have any expertise in heavy metals. You'll never do this. It's going to be inefficient and expensive and a waste of time. You should buy heavy metal from the rest of the world. That's what you should do. 
And the leaders of South Korea went, sound, yes, absolutely, we totally agree with you. And they went off and did it anyway. So they ignored the economists from the IMF. And what, and what happened? What happened? Vast technological progress. Their first cars were crap. Their second cars were crap. Their third cars were slightly less crap. And now the car park outside here is filled with South Korean cars. In your, in your, in your pockets are South Korean phones. <coughs> Above your head flying in the sky are South Korean satellites. Okay? This is a really important point, folks. Economic development is not something that you take from the rest of the world. It's something you build for yourself. So I mentioned there were two components to this thing, this building thing. The first is people who have ideas that can make them real. The second is energy. AI requires vast amounts of energy. Lucky for us, we happen to have the best energy. It's, where's West? <laughs> it's over there. It's over there. All we have to do is stick 500 Eiffel Towers into the sea. How cool is that? 500 Eiffel Towers into the sea. Get a wire, get a plug, <laughs> off we go. <laughs> I say this to my friends who are engineers and they just go, you know, you just, you just, the complexity of the thing, I don't care about the complexity. What I care about is the fact that this country needs 30 gigawatts and there are 75 gigawatts out there. And we are not doing it. And my sense of frustration is total about this. But we'll get there. We'll get there. So that's the framing of all this. That's where, we, that's where we're going. We're at or near the frontier of this now for the first time in our, in our nation's history. We have the opportunity to become an absolutely incredible sustainability, sustainable energy exporter. And we can export ide our ideas to the rest of the world and we can do well. So I'll take it back down now. I'll talk a little bit about this. This, I've been in UL 17 years, six months, 14 days. In that time, in that time I've done lots of things. I've led research projects, like you said. I've done, I've done, I've, I've, I've run an economics department. Uh, we've got the most popular economics degree in the country. It's, it's great, like it's all flying. Um, and I've had up, loads of ups and I've had loads, loads of downs. Um, I, I've, I, I'm, I, I'm much more interested in the development of UL as an institution now. But this is actually the proudest day I've ever had as a faculty member in UL. So this is, this is the first day that the immersive software engineering students arrived. There are 25 of them. Um, if, you're, if you're looking and you're counting, you can see there's about a 29% gender balance thing, which is dreadful. Uh, but it's also the best in the country for, for computer science. So this, this degree is, was, uh, uh, um, this, is, uh, this is my fifth year working on this degree. In fact, this is my fifth, on, in February, it was my fifth year working on it. Um, and why is an economist interested in developing a computer science degree? Well, I've just told you, right? I've just told you why. Because in order for this country to be better, we need people who can take ideas and make them real. And that has to happen in about four different areas. Computer science, bioscience, food, public policy, and probably, probably uh, offshore wind engineering, right? There will never be an immersive English, because I think we're grand at English ourselves. What is immersive software engineering? My first title for immersive software engineering was called Creating Digital Futures. It's interesting that it connects. I wanted to create people who not only understood that they could uh, create a digital future, but who could actually do it. So what is it? It's a master's degree in three and a half years. The students have five placements within it. We, we teach them in a, in a studio-based environment. We work the arses off them. We, each of these uh, 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 people is exceptional. They're absolutely exceptional. So the points to get into this, the minimum points are 803. Um, so if you're thinking that sounds a little high, 
you're, you're not wrong. So we have a portfolio, uh, an entrance submission, and we, have, um, and we also have the leaving certificate. So it's, it's the only engineering course like it. There was actually one at DCU. Uh, so we took the portfolio idea from a course in DCU. Uh, there, there is, there's blocks. There's blocks of instruction. There are no modules. There's blocks. Um, we took that from a, a course in 20 in, in the Netherlands. Studio-based learning, I took that from the architects that I worked with in the City Exchange program. And there's lots of industry connections and industry collaboration because that's how economics works. Economics, we, it's absolutely natural for an economist to talk to everyone else. Why? Because we don't know anything for real, to be honest. But also because it just economics is the most naturally interdisciplinary uh, subject there is. Um, <clears throat> so if we just take, uh, uh, take, there's Rosie. So that's Rosie Canelli. Rosie's, uh, if, you were, if you were looking at the My Uni Life program last Thursday, you saw, our, you saw the immersive software program there. Uh, she's an artist. The, she decorates our whole space with portraits of everybody. Uh, she, uh, she had never coded before. So after nine months, she went to a company called Viotas, which is an electricity exchange, and she refactored their entire code base. Now, it's an electricity exchange. It can't go wrong. But they gave her the project anyway. This is Pardis. Pardis went to BD, uh, uh, Becton Dixon, um, and she displaced two senior devs uh, uh, in her project and w was working away. That's Adam there. There's always one with the eyes closed. Adam went to Analog, working on computer vision. Uh, that's Amy. She's from Galway. Uh, 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 um, she's an ex they're, they're all exceptional people. Um, but the thing I love like most about this is if you saw them now, they're 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 two years older, right? But um, they've all now they're all now on their third placement. So if you take uh, uh, if you take I don't know Aina, that guy there, Aina Bonner. So Aina went to Mana Aero doing drone delivery, computer vision, right? And then he went to uh, AWS, and now he will be going to Stripe. So these guys are going to have an incredible experience. Uh, if we pick another guy, Dara Newsom there at the back. Dara won UL's uh, uh, Student Entrepreneur of the Year Award um, in his first semester. The people were coming up to me going, did you coach him? And I was like, I didn't even know he was entering. You know, they're, they're just, they're, they're, they're those people. If these were your kids, you would never shut up about them. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You'd be that annoying bastard. And anyway, look, it's great. And I'm really proud of them, and I'm really, really, really chuffed with them. And I, I show this picture on every slide. And like, I can show you pictures of every one of these students, and we have another cohort that's in now. So the first cohort is 25, second cohort is 50, third cohort probably 75. We got our CAO figures. It's grand. It's grand. Um, Right today, uh, I, I, right after this, I have to go back down to Limerick because we're doing a big open day for the people to, who have put in our, um, our thing, uh, who have put in the portfolio, because what we want to do is make sure that they all do really good portfolios, and I think 250 people are showing up. So it's really good. Um, so w I wanted to talk a little bit about, and I'll finish up on this, about AI, because I want to keep you on time. Um, so the AI Advisory Council, by the way, hands up who's used AI. Look around. Just keep your hands up and look around. It's really interesting. Every, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter any, everywhere I go in Ireland, and I've been, I was in Sligo this week, and I was in Dublin, and I was talking to OpenAI and, and, and all that. It's really, really interesting. Everywhere I go, if you ask, anyone to put their hand up. It's absolutely gendered. So interesting. Men do this. <laughs> Women do this. So it's always the same. And it doesn't matter where you go. It's always the same. Anyway, you've all used it. You're all scared of it, right? No. Correct answer. You shouldn't be scared of it. You shouldn't be scared of it. You should be aware of its downsides, okay? You should be aware of its downsides, but you should not be scared of it. And the reason you shouldn't be scared of it is because you've seen technological revolutions happen before, okay? I think, the, I think Ireland's 
position as a leader in AI is completely dependent on its teachers getting to grips with it as fast as possible. And I'm extremely heartened to do this, that, uh, to see this, because I, I go around, I do these talks, and I hear from people. Here's a brilliant example. A teacher read her kids under the hawthorn tree, right, which we've all read. And then she got them to get ChatGPT to summarize it. ChatGPT was wrong. Kids were like, oh, it's wrong. And she got them to figure out how and where the AI was wrong, teaching them criticality, self-reflection, reading, all the good stuff. Then she got them to tell the AI that it was wrong. Then she got them to rerun the exercise and the AI got it right. So she's teaching them learning. She's teaching them criticality. Good pedagogy defeats any kind of doomerism about this technology. And that's why I was really excited to come up here to talk to you today, because that's where this is going, OK? If we go, you can't use this, they're going to do it anyway. If you say it's a disaster, or it's just a spell check, or it's just a calculator, you're minimizing what is a genuine technological revolution. They will innovate beyond you, it'll be, and, and, and you will become irrelevant to them. If, you go, if, you're, if you're overly maximalist, that'll be a problem too. So I just want to finish off by talking a little bit about the AI Advisory Council and what we're here to do. We, are, we were set up by the minister this last month, or January, um, and we exist because there is a new AI Act. The AI Act is, it has been uh, uh, um, agreed at the European uh, uh, Commission, the European Parliament, and it will filter down into our laws very soon. Um, so there's a framework, a regulatory framework, around which we will need to classify different types of AI from low risk to medium risk to high risk to, please, dear God, don't do that risk, right? Um, and our job as the council is to really sync between different regulators and sync between different areas. So we've got economists and computer scientists and lawyers and uh, a very broad brush of society and re representatives of industry on that panel as well. Uh, our job is to advise the uh, Ireland's AI ambassador, on, on, uh, who's Dr. Patricia Scanlon, on, 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 this, on her work, and also to make sure that when government agencies come and ask us for our advice, or we're, we give it really, we give the best advice we can. And so, for example, one of the things we're looking at is election disinformation, which is a really, really, really big problem. AI. Everyone talks about AI and its ability to take away your agency and you know, deep fakes and all that kind of stuff. Um, but there's also an AI that can help combat that. And so it's really knowing that. And uh, I, I have to say, I find myself in, in an incredibly optimistic <coughs> space because I can see what people are using this technology for. And it's just going to be awesome. And your job will be making sure that every kid gets a chance to see this technology, to manipulate it, to become an expert with it, and then they can make their ideas real. And that is how we secure this country for the next 100 years. So with that, uh, let me thank you for your time and attention. Cheers.
idea, you want to go somewhere, get mentored, maybe get a bit of government funding, that kind of thing. Um, 70 is probably too many in a country of 5.8 million people. Um, there are much bigger ones and much smaller ones. Some of them are just rooms in you know, areas and stuff. Uh, I think what we need to do with, with, with all of this is realize that it's not the room that matters and it's not, it's not the government supports even that matter. It's the fact that there's a culture where you know you can do this. And so what's really, really interesting is seeing uh, um, when you go to San Francisco, and I've been there, I was there last March, um, there's a certain feeling. It's just, I, can't, I can only describe it as a feeling of fizziness. So people kind of fizz off each other, and there's an energy there. And when you go to Dog Patch, so I was there on Tuesday or Wednesday uh, this week, I think. Um, it could have been last week, like literally the, the day is blur sometimes. Um, no, it was Wednesday. Uh, so, so when you're there, you get the sense, the same sense of fizziness. It's energy. It's like, oh my God, I, I could talk to you and I've got a startup and can you help me with that? Yes, I can. Oh, great. And then there's like the guy with all the money is just there, you know, and, and it's that kind of thing. There's a, a, there's a, there are the components of a proper uh, uh, con connective tissue thing. And I, I think what's interesting is it, it, it's taking, taking a long time to do that in, 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 in Dublin. It's taken 15 years to do it in Dogpatch. Um, it'll take longer to do it in like Calorglan, but you can do it in Calorglan. In fact, this is a fantastic one in Calorglan. So it can happen, right? It's just a case of saying, of knowing that you need to do this and then finding ways to do it. I, I think um, the other thing is to realize how much state support we have here relative to anywhere else in the world. So we have Enterprise Ireland. Enterprise, Enterprise Ireland is the largest venture capital firm in Europe. Like, not in Ireland, in Europe. We spend, we, we spend billions over a decades on our startup ecosystem, right? And, and people go, oh, it's a waste of money. What's the return on investment? I refer you back to our South Korean car maker, right? Yes, maybe the return on investment is actually negative, but all you need to have is 20 unicorns and it goes positive, right? So do we need to rethink of our incubator strategy? Probably, but only in the sense that we bring kids through it a little faster and we, we let them understand that. The other thing is, as in third level, we need to be giving people chances to do startups in college. So what this year, this, uh, so we're, so yesterday, in fact, yeah, yesterday's Friday. So well, we have these residence, uh, residencies. So they're placements are called residencies because they're modules with learning outcomes, right? So that's why we call them residencies. But the, because we, ISE has a medical school timetable. We teach them for 44 weeks of the year. Okay. When I said we work the arses off them, I really wasn't. Yeah. Right. So, uh, by the way, the medical school is 40 weeks of the year, so we teach them longer. Um, and they have uh, these, these residencies. The residencies are the exact same thing as uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the medical residency. We, we want people to be able to do a surgical residency. You, I want somebody to cut, at the end of it, you've got to be able to cut somebody open, sew them back up, send them off. Right? We're the same. If you go and come and do a user experience residency, you know, uh, uh, so there, there, so so there's Desiree, right? She's she's off to do a user experience residency now, and and she, she she'll have to make that work. We've created a new kind of residency called a startup residency, where we're going to send ten of these guys to Dogpatch for six months. So now think about this, right? We're sending them to work on their own startups or work with other startups. Actually, we haven't publicly announced that yet. <laughs> okay. Um. <laughs> okay. Bye. <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> the first day. So, oh, they're gonna kill me. Okay. All right. So, so uh, no, please don't retweet that, Jesus. Anyway, uh, people are like. Uh, anyway, so we're gonna send them to the dog punch. And we're going to have them work on startups. Their own startups. Some of them have their own startups. Uh, some of them have. Uh, uh, some of them want to work on their friends' startups. And we're going to accredit their time as a module, right? So now think about that. Think about the ECTS credits of that. The external examination of that. And we're clear on this. Obviously, we didn't just like make it up and run off it, right? But, but like it, it, it requires a little bit of academic leadership. So Dr. Flynn will probably know this. Like, like you want to do what? 
You know, I actually, I heard that a lot when I was developing IC. You want to do what? No exams, no lectures, no timetables. What? You want to use the lecture theater for how long? I was like, yes, and also it can't be a lecture theater. Okay. So you can just imagine, if you work in big institutions, you can imagine how many conversations of like, we've never done that before, I heard. Anyway, so, so that'll be really interesting. So we're going to see how that goes. The other thing I want to do with this, I haven't announced that either, so I'm going to shut up. What was your second, <laughs> what was your second question? Sorry, I, yeah, I answered your first question. What was your second one? Sound. Yeah. Great. Um, once you move beyond the incubation level, how do you mitigate against companies that are just at the edge of becoming world class and a multinational comes along with a big lot of cash? So this is the scale-up problem. So the problem is you go from zero to a million in revenue. You go from a million to five million in revenue. And then you go from five to 50. And then some multinational go, co comes and goes, how would you never like to work again? And people go, sound. I'd like that. And then, th and then it just gets absorbed. And the, uh, the person then becomes an angel investor. But that company never becomes a, a unicorn. Right? So there's, two, there's two points to that. The, the first is there has to be a person who can lead that person forward. And we have that, actually, because of Intercom. People don't realize, people will be writing books about Intercom in 10 years' time. They don't realize that what Intercom really is, in addition to an incredibly successful company in their own right, they're leaders uh, uh, in the startup space because you can have a cup of coffee with these people. They're from the same place as you. And they'll go, don't do that. Here's what I did, and it's working out great. You know? And so there's an exemplar uh, aspect. That's one thing. The second thing is we need to change, change the tax treatment for this. So at a certain point, if you're at 50 million, like you're, you're working very, very, very hard, right? And it could still go wrong. This is the important point. It could still go wrong. So why wouldn't you cash out? Yeah? And the answer is, if you cash out now, you'll be rich for the rest of your life. That's fine. But you will never build the really, really, really big business. And I think one of the things that we tend to do is we tend, again, it comes back to culture. And, but, but I can guarantee you a favorable taxation system will beat culture every day. So we just need to be a little nicer to these people uh, as they're on the way up and then tax the arses off them when, 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 thing, when things work better, right? I think that's where, like, like, no, no, no. There is no free lunch here, folks. There's no free lunch. The state educated you. It, it, it educated you. You drove its roads. You, you got its workers from its universities. You had a great idea, but that doesn't make you Superman, right? You have to give back. And the giving back thing is really important, right? Um, so it's, there, there's that bit too. But I, I love the idea of like a citizenship ceremony, right? Have you ever been to a citizenship ceremony? You cannot be unhappy. After ever, you're just like, this is an amazing country. You're like, you're filled with love for the place. It's so good. I would like a citizenship ceremony for people who get rich. <laughs> I would like, I was like, you made how much money? <laughs> yes, instead of going, you know, and that feeling, like we need to get over that. We need to get over that and get over ourselves. And I need to get over myself and get you guys back on track because I've taken all your time. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you. <laughs>